Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series has proved to be a very interesting one entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm. This is lesson number 12 in that series for September 17 of 2022, entitled, Dying Like a Seed. Hmm. How does that fit with the crucible? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have bowed this evening, uh, representing your will, hopefully, in, in our discussions together. Guide and direct our discussion. Help us to know what you want us to say and say it with conviction. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What did Jesus say about dying like a seed, Jim? John chapter 12, verse 24. I am telling you the truth. A, gra a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. This is from the American Bible Society. Good okay. Carrie, you want to read the next one? From the Bible study guide, Jesus' picture of a kernel of wheat dying is a fascinating analogy of our submission to God's will. First, there is the falling. The kernel that falls from the wheat stalk has no control over where or how it falls to the ground. It has no control over the ground that surrounds and then presses over it. Second, there is the waiting. As the kernel lies in the earth, it does not know what the future holds. It cannot, quote unquote, imagine what life will be like in the future, for it uh, is only a kernel of wheat. Third, there is the dying. The kernel cannot possibly become a wheat stalk until it gives up its safe, comfortable situation as a kernel. It must quote-unquote, die. That is, it must give up what has always been before so it may be transformed from a seed into a full-bearing plant. It's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study for Sabbath afternoon, September 10. Hey, don't we have adequate opportunity? We, as living in the final days of this earth's history and Seventh-day Adventists, don't we have adequate opportunity for learning God's will for our lives? We have scripture. We have the writings of Ellen White. Why is it so difficult to choose to follow God's will as opposed to following our own will? We talked about that last week. God's will, my will. Hmm. Is it always clear what God wants us to do? A careful examination of the scriptures and the writings of Ellen White make it clear that God asked her to do, God asks us to do three essential things to grow our Christian experience. One, Bible study. Two, prayer. And three, witnessing. How many of these things are major activities in our lives? What would happen if all Seventh-day Adventists practiced doing these three things? What would happen to us if we did them on a regular basis? Okay, well, I don't know why I had some words to say about that. It is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scriptures what is truth, and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. Great God. To perhaps answer your question, if we all performed Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, we probably wouldn't be on this earth much longer. That's right. As we read about last week, Ellen White said in 1880s, we should have been in, the, in heaven before that. And many times she says, there's not one twentieth part, and in one place she says, and maybe more than one place, not one part out of a hundred is doing what they should be doing, in fact, and then she says, it would be if we were all doing what we we're supposed to be doing, it would go, uh, w things would move along a hundred times faster. 
In this series of lessons, we have talked about crucibles, and the greatest example of all of someone who experienced crucibles was Jesus Christ. So here we have an incredible uh, set of, of, of verses that talk about that. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Christ Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of, the, of God the Father. Good News Bible. Okay. How many is included if you say all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below? Satan How many does that include? Saved hmm? all. Okay. Does that include Satan himself? Yes. Absolutely. It's that day is going to be an absolute eye opener for a lot of people. And you have discussed this before. This happens in the third coming on the walls of Jerusalem. Yep. Yeah. I hear an increasing number of people saying. That means that Satan will be saved. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Yeah. In Philippians 2, 5 to 8, the first few verses there, we learn three things that we need to understand to follow the example of Jesus. One, our minds need to be like those of Jesus Christ. Hmm. We need to think like, we need to learn to think like him. Two, Jesus came to this earth and took upon himself human nature with all our limitations. So we, we, we can't say, well, no, I, I can't be expected to do that because look at Jesus, look who Jesus was. I'm just an ordinary human being. No, Jesus came as an ordinary human being. Three, he did not come as a powerful, even glorious human being, but instead he came like all other human beings. We know that Jesus came not only to live that noble life without sinning, but also to die that death to demonstrate the results of sin. And we'll talk more about that. Jesus died accused of being a traitor to the Roman government. He died in the most ignominious way in which the government of Rome could imagine, held up to contempt but for all eyes to see, dying as a common criminal. Jesus died a terrible death from a human standpoint. His real death was a death that resulted from sin. He took upon himself sin, not because he was a sinner. Jesus died the death that sinners will die in the end, separated from God, the only source of life. He did this to prove that what he had said at the Garden of Eden was true. And what did he say back then? You shall surely die. Okay. Myra, I think you're... Oh, I... Genesis 2? Genesis 2, 16 and 17. You may eat, this is God saying this, uh -huh. you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Good News Bible. Okay. So his message was painfully clear, as stated by Paul in Romans 6, 23, many, 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 many years later. Charles? From the writing of Ellen White. No, Romans 6, 23 first. Okay. For the wages of sin is death. Uh -huh. Sin pays its way, death. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, by the way, I just cannot help it but comment that uh, all the, all the Protestants, except the Seventh Adventists, now believe that you really don't die. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you live forever mm -hmm. in hell. So, uh, the Reformers didn't believe that, but yeah. today it's there. From the writings of Ellen White, as he hung on the cross, 
the wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. As his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of the guilt to bear, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, let's, let's spell this out very clearly. He's experiencing the wrath of God, right? We said there, right at the beginning, the wrath of God against sin. And so what happens when he experiences the wrath of God? He cannot see the Father's wreck. In other words, what hap what's happening here? God is giving a demonstration. He's allowing Jesus as a human being to be separated from him as God, okay? Sin is separating the Son from the Father. I think that's what killed him. Well, read on. That's gonna, we're, we're gonna find out. <laughs> the withdrawal of the divine continence from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, now. I want you to think of the implication of that last sentence. What had Jesus been through? Think of the beatings, think of the torture, think of, you know, his ble bleeding back, think of his, you know, his arms, think uh, the, the, the thorns, uh, cr the crown of thorns on his head and so forth, blood tr trickling down over his face and over his eyes and he can't, he can't wipe it, the blood out of his eyes. If you ever get blood in your eyes, You'll, you know what I'm talking about. But Jesus said, what worried him most of all, the most painful thing to him was what? The fact that he couldn't see, see his, his father. father. In other words, sin had separated himself from his father. He said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Yeah. We're gonna get to that in a moment. Yeah. Very good point. But, let, Think about this, the implication is this, do we feel uh, that kind of pain every time we sin? Good point. Do we, when we sin, we're separating, we're choosing to sin, we're separating ourselves from God. Do we feel that kind of pain? Hmm. Satan with his fierce, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Christ. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Okay, hold on a second. We said that Sin has separated from, God. when God's wrath takes place, sin separates a person from God. In this case, we're talking about Jesus. So he feared that sin was so offensive to God that his separation, God is not torturing Jesus on the cross as so many people believe. He's separating himself from Jesus. And he's fearing, Jesus is fearing that that separation is going to be eternal. That is what's, what's driving him crazy. This, this, he was prepared for this moment, yet he was, mm -hmm. you see, remember he says, I laid this, my life, myself, my life down, and I t t bring it back. Mm -hmm. But he was looking forward to it. You see, now he's really truly in the crucible himself. Yep. And well, uh, look what it says next. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Okay, what does that mean? Christ is experiencing what the wicked will experience when they're finally separated from God the last time at the third coming, right? What does it say? Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. When does God stop pleading for the guilty race? When there's no more hope, right? 
it is finished. Yes. Go ahead. It was the sense of sin beginning bringing. bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 5 and 753. Remember that the Bible term God's wrath is his allowing us to separate from him as we persistently insist. Those who thus insist will then cease to exist. Okay. God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway. That's an unpardonable sin. Yeah, that's what yeah. That's what's happening here. <clears throat> Notice that the wrath of God caused him to withdraw, caused him to withdraw from sinners. When he withdrew from Jesus on the cross, it broke the heart of Jesus and caused his death. God did not torture Christ on the cross. God let him go. And Gordon already pointed out, what did Jesus say? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? At the third coming, God will not be torturing the wicked. He will be withdrawing from them. And they will experience that terrible separation from God which Christ experienced on the cross. Jesus' most awful experience was feeling the separation from his father. He had never experienced that before. As the father withdrew himself from his son, as if, notice, as if, Jesus were a sinner at the third coming. He, Jesus was not a sinner, but it's as if he were a sinner. Do we experience that kind of terrible feeling of separation from God every time we are led into sin? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. There's a great emphasis in our culture today on demanding one's rights. Each individual group wants to demand its own rights. Christians should only demand their rights if those rights are consistent with Christian ideals. Satan demanded his rights in heaven. We know what, and we know the results. How often do I demand my human rights and thus avoid doing God's will for my life? <clears throat> okay, notice these words from Ellen White. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his work was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing, willing and uncomplaining. Yet he did not fail nor become discouraged. He lived above these difficulties as if in the light of God's countenance. He did not retaliate when roughly used, but bore insult patiently. Desire of Ages, 89, paragraph 4. Wow. Can we come to live like that? <clears throat> Does our Christian responsibility include knocking on people's doors to become better acquainted with them and then inviting them to study the Bible? Could it just mean leaving some literature at their doors? Does it include speaking up when we see or hear someone making fun of Christianity? Or speaking up or even speaking up even when someone is using God's name as a swear word? Does it mean volunteering to assist with various programs at the church? Lots of possibilities here, right? Jim, Romans 12. So then, my brothers and sisters, because God's mer great mercy to us, I appeal to you, <coughs> offer yourselves a living sacrifice to God dedicated to his service and pleasing him. This is the true worship that you sh should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, that it, what is good and is pleasing to him and his perfect good news Bible. So what does it mean to be a living sacrifice according to Romans 12? It's important to notice that God is asking for living sacrifices, not dead sacrifices. In the Old Testament, it was dead sacrifices, but now God wants what? Living sacrifices. So what is a living sacrifice? Did God ask for dead sacrifices in the Old Testament? Well, they thought so, didn't they? They did. But and he a, said, if you sacrifice, mm -hmm. then... This is a challenging and very personal question. Do you know what being a living sacrifice means in your own life? 
After considering Romans 12, 1 to 2, which Jim just read for us, does it require any sacrifice to give up our favorite forms of entertainment and instead to study the Bible and pray? What kind of sacrifice is required to go out witnessing to our neighbors? Are we all comfortable doing that? The work of the Holy Spirit is partially to let us know about the trouble spots in our lives. Elizabeth Elliot, a Christian writer, wrote, Carrie? The surrender of our heart's deepest longing is perhaps as close as we come to an understanding of the cross. Our own experience of crucifixion, though immeasurably less than our Savior's, nonetheless furnishes us with a chance to begin to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. In every form of our own suffering, he calls us to that fellowship. And that okay. comes from Quest for Love. Never heard of the Fleming Revel. Yeah. Yeah. Quote in our Bible study guide. We need to have a clear understanding of God's plan for our lives. We must be willing to do His will instead of our will. Then our minds will be renewed. But notice death to self comes before we can know God's will for us. Are we willing to specifically ask the Holy Spirit to inform us about any area or areas in our lives where need, which needs to be given up? I mean, point out our, our weaknesses? Point out our weaknesses. Would we ask God to do that to us? Would we dare? Would we listen? Mm. 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 3, 18, it's a fairly long section, tell the terrible story of the disobedience, open rebellion, and wicked lives of Eli's son. And who was Eli? Uh, was like Eli was the prophet. He was the high priest at yeah. that time. Into that awful situation, Hannah gave her son, who had been given to her miraculously following her prayer at the sanctuary. She gave Samuel to live in that sanctuary under the directions of, yeah. under the direction of Eli. And I don't, was that a crazy thing to do? Certainly does seem like a good point. Oh, anyway. Who's next here? Uh, Duane, I guess, 1 Samuel 3.10. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak, your servant is listening. Think of the incredible cro contrast presented in these stories. Eli, the high priest for the nation of Israel, and presumed to be the one to speak on God's behalf to the people, that was his job, and his evil sons, pretending to be priests, are passed over and God spoke to the young boy Samuel, living in the sanctuary. Ellen White in Child Guidance wrote, the neglect of Eli is brought plainly before every father and mother in the land. As a result of his unsanctified affection or his unwillingness to do a disagreeable duty, he reaped a harvest of iniquity in his perverse sons. Both the parent who permitted the wickedness and the children who practiced it were guilty before God. Even the high priest was guilty? Mm. Yep. And he would accept no sacrifice or offering for their transgression. Ellen G. White, Child Guidance 276. So God saying, you can't just offer a dead sacrifice to take care of that kind of sin. You can't just say, I'm sorry. No. Please forgive me. Would God speak to us if we were open to listening? The well-known preacher Charles Stanley suggested something interesting. The Holy Spirit does not speak for the sake of passing along information. He speaks to get a response. And he knows when our agenda is, has such a large slice of our attention that it is a waste of time to suggest anything to the contrary. Okay, so what's he saying there? God can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> okay. When that is the case, God, he is often silent, the Holy Spirit. 
He waits for us to become neutral enough to hear and eventually obey from the wonderful spirit-filled life. And again, quote in our Bible study guide. Did the Holy Spirit speak to and through the Bible writers for the sake of passing along information? Well, some, to us in the Bible, especially information about himself and how he has dealt with sin in the universe. The Bible is all about God and all what he wants us to know about himself. But as he wants not just to pass along some information, he wants a response, right? What would it mean in our lives to be still and listen for the voice of God? At the end of busy days. Hmm. The story of Eve in the Garden of Eden is an example of what happens when human beings reject following God's will and believe that they can make wise choices based on their own understanding and feelings. Another example of that sort of terrible mistake is the story of Saul, King Saul. Saul had been anointed by Samuel as a choice that the people wanted for their new king. Yeah, big, tall, strong guy. Yeah, this is the kind of king we want. Then Samuel gave directions to Saul, telling him to go to face off with the Philistines. Now, he had actually done that before, and he, he did it with the Amalekites. Well, what happened in this case, the story is told as follows. Charles? 1 Samuel 13, 11 to 14. Shall I read the 1 through 14. 1 through 14. And let me just make a comment about the first verse there. One ancient translation does not have verse 1. Not e verse 1 is just not even there. The Hebrew has verse 1, Saul was blank years old when he became king, and he was king of Israel for a blank and two years. The Hebrew text is defective at two points in this verse. What would you do if you had that text? If you look through the rest of the the stories of the kings, they always say, he so-and-so was su so, such and such an age when he became king, and he reigned for a certain number of years. So what happened to Saul's story here? The Bible writer screwed up. Either that or something got erased and they didn't... It's likely that the original author, who was compiling all this information together, realized that he didn't have the actual information about Saul. So he left that blank there, and he went ahead and thought, okay, I'll come back to it later, put it in there, and he never did. Would a Bible writer make that kind of a mistake? I wouldn't think so. No, but this Bible is... Bible writers don't make mistakes, yeah, right? But this is an ancient uh, transcript. There were more than one transcript, though, yeah. right? I mean, you... you you have studied history, so... Yes. This is one of the... There's, this is the only place in the Bible where that exact kind of problem takes place. There are other challenges in Scripture in other places, but this is a very unusual one. Okay, let's pick up the story. It's just... That's sure. a little... That's a little side, side. note. Yes. Saul so picked 3,000 men, keeping 2,000 of them with him in Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel and sending 1,000 with his son Jonathan to Gilboa in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin, the rest of the men Saul sent home. Jonathan killed the Philistine commander in Geba, and all the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul sent messengers to call the Hebrews to war by blowing a trumpet throughout the whole country. So in other words, let's, let's just pick this picture of the story here. Saul's anointed king, so he calls out, I mean, people say, okay, let's conquer our enemies. People come out, they're ready to fight, they're ready to go to war, and Saul says, well, I, I can't support all you guys. I don't have the money and so forth like this. Let me keep a few selected ones and we'll send the rest of you home. We'll call you if we need, if there's a war happens, we'll call you. So now he's calling them, okay? So this is the southern... Uh, before the separation, this is uh, yes, Benjamin yeah, is south. This is the first the king. Benjamite. The first king. He's yeah. In, so yeah. he's in his own territory. Yes. Getting the people. Right. Okay. 
All the Israelites were told that Saul had killed the Philistine commander and that the Philistines hated them. So the people answered the call to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines, look at this one, Philistines assembled the Israelites to fight the Israelites. They had 30,000 war chariots. <laughs> and there's questions about that. That seems a little extravagant, but that's what the text says. There's 6,000 horsemen and as many soldiers as there are grains of sand in the seashore. So, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, a lot. A lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yes. They went to Mikmash, east of Bethaven, and camped there. Then they launched a strong attack against the Israelites, putting them in the desperate situation. Some of the Israelites hid in the caves and holes or among the rocks in the pits and wells. Others crossed the river Jordan to the territories of Gad and Gilead. So what's happening here? Saul calls his army and what's, they're just scattering. Okay. Saul was still in Gilgal and the people with him were trembling with fear. He waited seven days for Saul, Samuel as Samuel had instructed him to do. But Samuel still had not come to Gilgal. The people began to desert Saul. So he said to them, bring me the burnt sacrifices and fellowship sacrifices. He offered the burnt sacrifice. And just as he was finishing, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet with him and welcomed him. But Samuel said, what have you done? So what has Saul done? He pretended that he was a priest. Yeah. He was offering the priestly sacrifices. Mm. He did something he was not told, told to never to do. Yep. Saul answered, the people were deserting me and you had not come when you said you would. Besides that, the Philistines are gathering at Michmash. So I thought, well, the Philistines are going to attack me here in Gilgal and I have not tried to win the Lord's favor. So I felt I had to offer sacrifice. Wow. Rationalization. Yeah, really. But he was, he was chosen by the Lord himself and he forgot that. Well, he, he, was, he was chosen because God knew that was the kind of person that the people wanted. And then later God said, now it's my turn to choose a person after my own heart. And that's when he chose David. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's a very yeah. good point. Yes. That was a foolish thing to do, Samuel answered. You have not obeyed the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had obeyed, he would have let you and your descendants rule over Israel forever. But wow. now your rule will not continue. Because you have disobeyed him, the Lord will find the kind of man he wants and make him ruler over the people, over and his guess people. guess who that is? King David. Yes. That was David. Yes. Notice carefully the three steps that led to Saul's downfall and, their, and in their order. One, Saul said, I saw. So what did Saul see? He saw the scattering of his troops in Samuel's absence. Mm. Saul was under pressure and he evaluated with his own eyes what was happening. Jim, you want to pick up there? Saul moved from, I saw to, I said, that the Philistines would conquer them, 1 Peter 13, 12. For Samuel. Samuel. For Samuel, excuse me, I don't want to see there. <laughs> what he saw with his own eyes shaped that he would, shaped what he said or surmised but they, about the situation. Saul moved from, I said, to, I felt compelled to offer sacrifice, 1 Samuel 13, 12. What Saul thought now shaped his feelings from the Bible study guide for September 14. So what we see here is Saul <laughs> sees a problem. He doesn't know what the answer is. He doesn't want to wait to, do, to wait for God's answer. So he thinks it through. He says, I have a plan. So he puts himself in place of God's choice, God's directions. Does that ever happen to us? Yep. 
Huh? Saul had had very clear instructions as to what he was to do. Why was it so easy for him to ignore those instructions and move forward with his own ideas? What might lead us to make similar mistakes? When are we supposed to use our own thinking and logic as opposed to following what God has told us? Or what we think God has told us? What we think God has told us, okay. We've waited 25 years, Abraham said. Yep. It's time. <laughs> we got to do it ourselves. Yeah. Satan has many devices that he will suggest as substitutes for, taking, for, for doing God's will. Some people bury themselves in entertainment. Our world is just going mad over entertainment. Others seek to bury themselves in their work. There's a few among us that are workaholics. Still others seek to find company among their friends as a substitute for following God's will. Notice three common substitutes we may use in place of following God. Okay, Carrie, you want to spell those out for us? Yes. From our Bible study guide? We use human logic or past experience when we need fresh divine revelation. We block problems from our minds when we need divine solutions. We escape reality and avoid God when we need communion with Him for divine power. Mm. That's that old Sabbath school Bible study guide. Yeah. The story of Israel's downfall and final conquest by the Babylonians is a terrible example of people turning away from God's will for their lives. When Medo-Persia became the ruling power following a period of 70 years in Babylonian captivity, the Jews were given the opportunity to return to Jerusalem. Only a very small percentage of them actually attempted to do that. One of the first things they needed to do after going home was to build a new temple. It was a much smaller structure than the wonderful building which Solomon had erected. But it was what they could do. That rebuilding of the temple was being done under the guidance and inspiration of Haggai and Zechariah. Okay, so now let's just review again. Jerusalem had completely been completely destroyed three times by Nebuchadnezzar. They were taken into Babylonian captivity for a period of seven year, 70 years. This was predicted, this was prophesied to Jeremiah twice. Okay, now these people have come back and they're trying to rebuild. And the first thing they're going to, trying to do is to build a temple, a place. They set up an altar first, immediately. And then they had to build a temple. So, in chapter 4, Zechariah described the fact that their only safety in that situation was clearly and carefully to follow God's plan for their lives. And remember, they had people around them that first of all wanted to join them in, in doing this, and then they wanted to prevent them from doing it. In this case, they actually did, and they accomplished a great work in a relatively short period of time. The temple was rebuilt, and the people rejoiced. A quick question. Yes. Um, we all know that the uh, uh, mercy seat was not there. The yeah. second, the, the uh, holy, most holy place was empty. How about the first and then the, uh, then the courtyard? Were those also not the original ones then? Those were the original ones. Those, those are ones were the original were ones. Were brought back from Babylonian. Babylon, yes. Oh, okay. In fact, yeah. the candlestick which is the one that's easiest to trace, was actually finally taken by um, Rome. If you go to the arch, uh, entering ancient Rome, in Rome, you will see up there uh, uh, the, the, the Roman army carrying the candlestick from Jerusalem, from the temple in Jerusalem, the very one that Moses made back in the beginning. There they're carrying it. And a report is given, and. I assume this is reliable. We don't have any reason to question it. That candlestick, that golden candlestick, was finally stolen by the... Um, who are the people in North Africa? Um, oh, man, i got a blank right now. The people who would love to come in and just oh. grab and... 
Anyway, they stole the candlestick and is never heard from again. So it finally ended up somewhere in North Africa. Okay. So how do we respond when we find ourselves in a crucible? Do you turn to food, television, or prayer with submission to God? Think about your personal experiences. From the Bible Study Guide, submission to God's will comes as we die to our own desires and ambitions. This opens the way for true service to others. We cannot live for God without becoming sacrifices and living in continual openness to God's voice. For us truly to submit our wills to our Father's will, we must recognize the dangers of relying on ourselves and on our substitutes for God's word and power. As submission to God's will is at the heart of a Christ-like life, God may allow crucibles to teach us dependence on Him. Mm. From the Bible Study Guide for Friday. Okay, so do we really believe that God's way is best? Theoretically, we all would probably say yes, right? Yeah. Why is it so hard <clears throat> to do that? Because I don't really know that it's God's will. Well, that might be part of the problem. And, and I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do is probably another big part of the problem. Probably the major one. We truly believe that our only hope is in becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Intellectually, thinking the subject to, we would say, yes, that's true. Think of his incredible condescension. How much do we have to give up in order to follow him? It might seem scary to give up our customary choices and move forward following God's plan for our lives without knowing for sure that where that will lead. God, God's will led Jesus all the way to the cross. How's that for an example? That seemed like a terrible idea, but it was the means of saving some of the inhabitants of our world by demonstrating the terrible results of sin, and of course we know all the implications of that. Is it possible that one of the things that we need to do is pray for those we know who are needing God's grace in their lives? How can we convince people that following God's will is the best way and the only right way for their lives? From the Bible Study Guide, death is a fascinating, fascinating element in all religions. In biblical Christianity, death has two connotations. On one hand, death is the, is the result of and punishment for sin. On the other hand, our life with God starts with death, death to sin. Only when we experience this death to sin can we fully enjoy life in God's kingdom. Death to sin leads to overwhelm, overcoming and confronting the death that is the result of sin. Both events are possible because of Christ's death for us. It's from our Bible, Bible study guide. Study guide. Again. Yeah. The lesson for this week highlights two major themes. Charles? Number one, death to sin sets the framework for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So why, why do we have to die to self before the Holy Spirit can take charge? Because self is so strong and doesn't want to let go. You, you, can't, you can't have two masters. You can't have two masters, okay? The Spirit himself personally implements the transformation of our characters unto the image of Jesus Christ and empowers us to, li to live lives of sacrificial services and obedience to God. Okay. Remember, it's only the Holy Spirit, only God working through the Holy Spirit that can transform our lives. We can't transform our lives. We can allow the Holy Spirit to do it, but we can't do it ourselves. If we do not experience death to sin, we will continue a life of self-centeredness and self-service, a life of sin that is, in fact, leads to death. Yeah. So, do, so what does it mean to die to sin? 
clearly a life of sin means following the example of Satan himself, a life of self-centeredness and selfishness. As we read earlier in this lesson, Adam and Eve were given very clear instructions regarding what they could do and could not do in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He said to him, this is God said to Adam, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. So what was wrong with that tree? Was there some poisonous element in that fruit? No, everything God had made in the garden was perfect. So what was the problem with that tree? There was nothing inherently wrong with that tree or any of the other trees in the garden. Jim? Ellen White, there was nothing wrong, excuse me, there was nothing poisonous in the fruit of the tree of knowledge itself, nothing that would cause death in partaking of it. The, true, the tree had been placed in the garden as a test there, to test their loyalty of God. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1896. Genesis 131, God looked at everything he had made and he and it was very pleased. Evening passed and morning came. That was the sixth day. So there was no evil trees there, there was no poisonous trees. Everything he made was good, right? That's what it says. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And so the whole universe became completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it <coughs> apart as a special day because by the, that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. Good news, Bible. Okay. Just as a note, we yeah. said that it says that the garden, the tree was placed in the garden to test their loyalty to God. Elsewhere, Ellen White says that it was actually a protection, that the tree yes. was a protection. Right that Satan was confined to that one place. He couldn't follow them throughout the garden. Right, exactly, a very important point. Sin only entered the human race when Eve and then Adam intentionally chose to disobey God's instructions. Yeah. And we have that clearly in Romans 5, 12. Carrie? Sin came into the world through one man and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. <clears throat> the Good News Bible. So the name of that tree is interesting. What does it mean to say that it is a tree of knowledge of good and evil? Certainly there's nothing wrong with having a knowledge of good. Satan claimed that having a knowledge of good and evil would make us more godlike. But what say that, that statement is not untrue. Well, that God is, has a knowledge of good and evil, you mean? Well, no, the, the, uh, the other gods have learned, uh, it was their experienced evil. They knew what God, good was, e good and e the difference between good and evil. Okay, and, and well, and there was a war in heaven that determined that, wasn't there? Yep. Okay, um, certainly. And also, when certain says you really won't die, based on past experience that, Satan had had and the rest of the heavenly intelligences, there had been no death. Yeah. But it, that was a, uh, an example of God's foreknowledge. She knew what <coughs> cause and effect and, and the consequences would be. Uh, but what Satan was challenging Eve to do was to ignore the clear guidance that God had given and to set herself up as a standard for deciding what was right and what was wrong. Do we ever take that challenge? When we do that, we choose to sin. We are suggesting that our will is more important than God's will. We, in effect, are placing ourselves in God's place. Carrie? Thus, the name of the tree and the narrative of Genesis 2 and 3 indicate that what changed was Adam and Eve's perspective, their view, their attitude, and their relation to God. Their choice was a matter of moral disobedience or rebellion against God. The expression to know good and evil in the Bible refers to moral maturity. When a person becomes an adult and autonomous or a moral judge, 
Okay, and there's several verses supporting that idea. Yeah. The issue around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was who was the judge and who was the source and standard of morality. By forbidding the eating of the fruit of the tree, God established himself as the ultimate source of morality on earth in the same way that he was in the universe. By eating from the tree, Eve and Adam decided that they were the source of morality. It is one thing for someone to exercise morality and distinguish between good and evil through the prism of God's re revelation. But it is another thing to set oneself as the source and standard of morality over against God's revelation and command. To do so is tantamount to declaring oneself God, to rebel against God, and to want to overthrow his throne. So let's just review, that's from our Bible study guide, just review a little bit there. What are we saying? If we follow God's guidance in choosing what is good and what is bad, and we follow God's guidance clearly, they're, they're, we're safe. If we don't follow God's guidance, what happens? We're basically saying, God, I don't need your help, I can do it myself. In our daily lives, are we willing to let God rule? Or will we choose to set ourselves up as the moral standard? God's will for our lives is always best, but this is a very hard lesson for selfish human beings to accept and follow. However, God cannot admit to heaven those who are going to choose to do it their way as Satan did. Otherwise, the great controversy, sin would enter the universe again. We'd just rehash the old problems again. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talk about the terrible rebellion of Satan in heaven. Dwayne? The world of the dead is getting ready to welcome the king of Babylonia. The ghosts of those who were powerful on earth are stirring about. The ghosts of kings are rising from their thrones. They all call out to him, Now you are as weak as we are. You are one of us. The dead will stare and gape at you. They will ask, is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? Okay, now let's uh, talk about this. This is not talking about uh, ghosts somehow, rather speaking, whatever. This is talking about people saying, okay, these kings in the past, they were thought they were great. What about you? You think you're better than all of them? Well, when it's all done and said, and when you're dead in the grave, you're no different than any of the rest. You're just lying in a coffin. Okay? Go ahead. And of course, it's talking about the king of Babylon, but the person behind that is who? Satan. Gordon, you want to pick up? Okay. Ezekiel 28, <clears throat> verse 2. Mortal man, he said, tell the ruler of Tyre that I, the sovereign lord, am what... I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying to, you, to him, puffed up with pride, you claim to be as God. You say that, that a God, you say that like a God, you sit on a throne surrounded by the seas. You may pretend to be a God, but no, you are mortal, not divine. Jumping to verse 9. When they come to kill you, will you still claim that you are a God? When you face your murders, you will be mortal and not at all divine. Verse 16, you were busy buying and selling, and this led you to violence and sin, so I forced you to leave my holy mountain, and the angel who guarded you drove you away from the sparkling gems. You were proud of being handsome, and your fame made you act like a fool. Because of this, I hurled you to the ground and left you as a warning to others the Good News Bible. Wow. So we're running out of time here, but God explained beginning with Genesis 2.17 and later in Romans 6.23, their rebellion against God, otherwise called sin, pays its wage. That wage of sin is death. But this death is not the ordinary death which is so familiar to us in our day. The final result of sin is what the Bible speaks of as a second death. That death re results 
as a which results as a direct rebellion against God, leading to a separation from Him. It results from choosing to live a life contrary to God's plan. We do not know exactly how God described death either to the angels or to Adam and Eve before they committed that sin. And Jim mentioned that earlier. Nobody had ever seen death. However, surely it must have been described in terms that seemed very serious and must have been adequate to allow them to make an educated decision. Is there a solution to that death? Yes, the Bible describes two types of death. <clears throat> Myra, I think this is you. Oh. First, Jesus died in our place and for us. He took our death upon himself and gave us the, the hope of eternal life. John 3, 16 and many other places. Second, our own death is indicated as well, but this death is not punishment for sin. Jesus died the death in our place. Rather, our death is to sin itself. Okay, let's explain just briefly here what is happening. And Jesus died the death that is a direct result of sin so that we don't have to die that death. Many of us will end up rebelling against God and dying that death, but we don't have to. God says, God has made provision so we don't have to. We must die to sin and must no longer control us in any way. <clears throat> but death to sin, by death to sin, the Bible means in exactly what it says. It does not say that we attain to eternal life, but literally by literally dying. We are not and cannot be paying for our sins with our own deaths. There is no salvific merit in our deaths. The only literal death that counts for our salvation is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Neither does the Bible use death to sin to communicate an indifference to the world, as in Buddhism, for instance. God created the world perfect for our enjoyment and for us to care for it. Death to sin, then, means acceptance, accepting the Lordship of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and rejecting the control of sin. We enjoy obeying God and serving Him. We are traditional, um, we are transformed into the image and mind of Christ who did not consider holding on to power, but stooped down to earth and took uh, our state, status and our um, place to save us. And we're running out of time, so what we're saying here is that God did the demonstration of sin so that we do not need to die. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, once again we thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping together, sharing these things, these lessons that are prepared for us and discussing them together. We thank you for this privilege and may it be a blessing to those who listen in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.